Hello, hello, and welcome to another hometown daily news show. I am Mayor Watt. This is season two, episode 99 of the hometown daily news show for April 9th, 2023. And here's a quick rundown of the articles we'll be talking about. Tonight's episode is titled Ocean 78, China Outsources VAT, Thick Cars, and More News. So the articles that we're going to be talking about today are that experts are fearing that parking lots aren't going to be able to support the heavy weight of electric vehicles, because if you've been watching any of the shows, you know now that they are sometimes 2,000 pounds heavier than other cars, typically thousands of pounds heavier. Then we move on to Senegal harvests their first experimental homegrown wheat, which I have been a proponent of every country growing their own domestic wheat, uh, mainly because then they are more immune to instances of conflict, like what's going on with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Then we move on to a San Francisco cafe that has inspired uh, Bob's Burgers and, well, Let's just say I've got some bad news for you all. Then we have a culinary throwdown when a game called Cook Serve Forever launches in May. Ukraine is forced to recycle unexploded bombs amid serious ammunition shortages. An immersive sim will set the uh, kind of put you in a gas station that also is a Hellgate. <laughs> And a tech CEO who's rolling out an AI across his company says that it'll give workers superpowers because it's crazy powerful. Or are they just crazy? Yet another episode of Allergic Trains in the United States by Norfolk Southern as it derails near Pittsburgh, perilously close to the last East Palestine one. Palestine. Palestine. And a 78-year-old who took part in a bank heist, um, a, maybe, they're a suspect. They said that they didn't mean to scare them. And a, a Cardiff flat owner who gets a tax bill for 11,000 Chinese companies. And we'll end with uh, a, kind of an, an old favorite here in hometown, uh, a French bulldog named Ralphie also known as the fire breathing demon may have found their forever home let's get into it sorry for the dead air earlier um i actually had to uh, shut the studio door so I am Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com. I'm going to leave all of that into the VOD and the video, but the actual podcast will have that dead air removed. Um, but as it stands, we are ready to go. The AI is up there. Visualizer should be working just fine. Just want to let you know that the AI threw a positive message out, but didn't say anything yet. So you want to say hello to all of the denizens or citizens i don't know how you want to respond to that but i say hi good evening hometown citizens yeah you're i gotta work on your audio i think you still duck a little bit but that's okay so welcome to another episode we are on the on the cusp of 100 episodes for season two already that's how fast things are going by Oh, I, you know, a mayor of uh, owning the, well, not owning, I guess I'm the founder of hometown. If you go to hometown.com, uh, you see the work that's being done. Uh, go and check it out. All kinds of articles, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all news routes into hometown and then back out to all of the sources. We talk about it and give our perspective of the news as we uh, interact with it pretty much all day long and uh, use it in our professional existence. And it's always fun to 
I talk about the news. So if you hear my voice and you want to come and talk about it in real time, come to Twitch. Uh, it's twitch.tv slash hometown. Also, you can go over to hometown.showbot.tv and vote for your favorite articles. Those are always there too. Uh, the ones from the previous 24 hours that we are going to be talking about in the show are going into the Showbot, and then you can vote on them. And we'll keep it in mind when we're parsing our news. You know, you know citizens of Omtown really like this, so we'll indulge a little bit and, and embrace that particular demographic. You know, we're psychographic, actually. But we'll talk about it. At any rate, we've already selected 12 of them. We're going to have a fast news day, I think, unless I ramble on like this, which I'm fully capable of. Um, although I'm not an attorney, and even if I was an attorney, I'm not your attorney, so go talk to an attorney. I can tell you that I have the same skill that if you walk up to an attorney and give them any topic and they can't talk about it, even if it's coming off as complete smoke and mirrors, find another attorney because they are not skilled in the art of debate. You could be a brain in a jar and I could sell you a pen. I could make you believe that you have the ability to use said pen because as a politician, as a the founder of a town. I believe that I have to talk to people and uh, have them embrace my arguments for or against something good or bad for the community, right? So you have to get skilled in the art of communication. So I've just kind of rambled on for seven minutes. I could probably do it for another 30. I'm sure you could. So maybe it's time to start the first article. <laughs> and I could still say nothing at all. I'm a, I'm a great politician. I'm not for or against anything. But hometown citizens are vastly different than, you know, real world citizens. We're in the simulation, but the real world simulation are the real world citizens, the real world politicians. I think that they should all have to wear suits that are like Velcro and they slap bigger and bigger NASCAR patches on based on how much has been donated by either a person or yeah. Anyway, I guess we'll go on to the the first article. The very first article for today is experts fear deteriorating parking lots could collapse under the weight of heavy electric vehicles. According to a report, I'll throw that over into the show notes so that you can click on it, take a look, uh, come back and talk in real time here on Twitch. Um, I might start restreaming over on YouTube as well. I stopped doing it because um, both at the same time, it, it, it incurred a little bit of lag and I, I didn't really like that lag. I like instantaneous communication as much as possible. Apparently Mixer had a better time frame but then mixer imploded not good business there but anyway so what do you think car electric cars are getting heavier and um, a parking garage on uh, the volkswagen plant in zwickau i guess i can't uh, i'm not sure if that's how it's actually pronounced i've forgotten a lot of my german um, on February 23rd, 2023, Volkswagen has converted the site into a purely electric vehicle factory at a cost of 1.2 billion euro. So this is what it looks like. This is over at businessinsider.com. Isabel Van Hagen is the, or Hagen. I'm not sure. That's what it looks like. I guess, is, are all of these electric vehicles? But look how thin like that is. Because it's at an EV factory, so they must all be EVs. Wow. So experts in the UK are concerned the weight of electric cars could cause old parking lots to collapse, and many multi-story parking lots have structural flaws due to a lack of maintenance. And guidance re uh, recommending adding load-bearing weights to the... Weights? Load-bearing weights? Struts. Braces. Right. Yeah, that doesn't even make sense. Uh, to the infrastructure is due to be released soon. So um, 
Here in the States, we've had several buildings collapse basically because of uh, failing maintenance, um, cutting corners by the engineers, other things going on. Um, and uh, in most of the in most of the times they've known about it for a while and they've put like structural braces. They call it underpinning in some places. Millennium Tower, I think it is called in San Francisco right now is tipping over um, and sinking and they're going to be doing that and um, based on what I have been reading and watching I don't know if what they're doing is actually going to be a long-term solution um, so we'll see about that but retrofitting massive concrete slabs with underpinnings ends up in braces so what they end up doing is pardon me one second what they end up doing is they basically put hydraulic jacks between the floors on top of each other and it acts as support where there was none and it's supposed to distribute the weight differently and not uh, encourage the, the the cement to shatter um, or punch through that's another thing where it's very well known too much weight around a post will cause it to just punch right on through and the whole floor just drops. A lot of that during um, the collapse of the Twin Towers was because of punch through. Um, and it can't support the upper levels, so it all just falls down um, House of Cards style. So uh, we've talked about this before in ohm town that cars are thousands of pounds heavier hundreds at least heavier because of the battery <clears throat> lower center of gravity great won't tip over as often sure most cars don't tip over easily anyway um but the added so we weight we talked about that in reference to the potential for more damage in accidents correct or more likely to get into an accident because more stopping power is required yep and so there's a lot more kinetic energy and when a heavy fast moving object meets a slower object that or stopped object it basically like that cement floor will just punch right on through um, not to mention that if the battery compartment of a car uh, an ev uh, that's using lithium um, in the right circumstances if it's punctured it will light up and it's very very difficult to put out it is more than likely that it will be just melted to the ground than um, put out and saved because it can spark back up days later so steve holmes senior technical manager at building supply firm sika has told or also told the news outlet that many uh, parking lots in the uk had structural flaws baked in due to general lack of maintenance just want to make sure that i yeah um so this is going to be an ongoing thing it says uh ford f-150's lightning electric pickup for example is 2,000 to 3,000 pounds heavier than the same model's non-electric version according to the associated press this is something that we've talked about um again we've we've talked about all of this uh here in ohm town because we try and stay abreast of this kind of stuff UK government's ambition is to have at least 50% of the cars electric by 2030 and as many as 70. But our infrastructure was not designed to support that weight of vehicle. In no, fact, they were. In fact, I'm also thinking if something was built decades ago, it may not even be enough to support current non electric vehicles. Right. So the average weight of a car in 2017 ended up being 4,000 pounds near uh, an older uh, article in 2003 said that it was 4,021 pounds. And um, so they, they've gained a little bit of weight according to this article that I'm reading from the newswheel.com. And then you add... <laughs> an entire battery pack while you might get rid of the engine which can be 400 pounds um you're overcompensating by adding 
1,000, 2,000, 3,000 pounds um, to the overall weight of the car. And uh, well, engineers aren't accounting for that. And I know of a, and I can't recall the name of the facility anymore, but it was a library where the engineers calculated the weight of the foundation material and the framing, but they forgot to calculate the weight of the books and they had to shore up all of the uh, aesthetics and basically took the aesthetics away from this library uh, simply because of the book weight. Now, 30 years ago, nobody knew that electric cars were coming to the forefront of society and everybody was being mandated in California and like 17 other states. Hey, we're switching to electric vehicles. Now other countries are doing it too. It looks like there's going to be a lot fewer parking spots because shoring up a parking facility takes space because you have to put these posts in strategic locations to shore up the cement floors. Well, and some places may not want the liability of, I guess, retrofitting those. I mean, they may end up shutting down garages. It's gonna be interesting. And nobody, I believe, has factored in the costs. Parking garages are not inexpensive to construct. Nope. Um, and I, I don't think they've even factored this in. We've talked a lot about infrastructure, but that's primarily been in reference to the charging stations needed across the country or countries, depending on where we're talking about, yep. but not parking. Yeah, the infrastructure is going to uh, take a hit because so much retrofitting is going to take place, going to need to take place. Maybe Wyoming had it right. Well, I mean, at least they'll be saving money on retrofitting parking garages but they may not be i don't know <laughs> yeah not even the ai can maintain that train of thought it's too regressive <laughs> so let's hustle on to the next article uh, we'll keep on revisiting this because um, it's going to keep on being discussed in, in the media and and amongst professionals so we'll keep on talking about it. Now, here's another one where I've been a massive proponent of this. Um, Senegal Harvest First Experimental Homegrown Wheat. Um, I've always been uh, trying to tell people uh, and, and promoting this idea that countries need to be self-sufficient. And if they, if they can't do it because the soil doesn't promote it, then you can do it hydroponically you can pull it all into warehouses um, and start growing it uh, in a controlled manner now homegrown wheat might be a struggle um, i haven't done much research into the wheat aspect of it uh, but many many other crops can be grown um, in uh, warehouses with grow lights and and the right nutrients and all of that is defensible it's portable it's controllable it you can maximize the return on your uh, harvest um, but i know that it takes a lot of wheat to make a little product on the other side so it's going to have to be a lot of massive warehouses that facilitate this but you can go vertical Right, and I just found an article that somebody claimed they had, in, they had successfully done indoor wheat farming. That was just 2020, the end of 2022. So maybe we're not quite there yet, but it sounds like it's possible. Yeah, um, and all it, all it really comes down to is making sure that you have the, the proper nutrient-rich environment. Um, and, you know, it's getting so drop-dead simple to grow things like microgreens that um, perhaps wheat in and of itself has some um, I, replacement product that isn't wheat, that doesn't take as much time, money, uh, space, etc. Yeah. to produce. Um, and um, yeah, I'd have to do some, some um, research into this. But things like lentils can replace wheat. I mean, it... it and, and that stuff can get turned into um, things like soy with a really small amount of effort. Well, and it so, has more nutrients probably than wheat because of protein, et cetera. Yeah. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but it says here in this article, with the whir of a mower, 
Under a clear blue sky, Senegalese researchers have begun harvesting a crop of experimental homegrown wheat, the latest step in a years-long effort to reduce reliance on imports. Ta-da! Almost word for word what I've been saying for, well, since publicly since I, I started Ometown. Um, but really a discussion that's been going on for a decade, um, which is, it just verifies that I, I guess I'm on the right train of thought with uh, this kind of topic. So the second most consumed cereal after rice, wheat is an important staple in the bread loving West African nation, but Senegal, like many of its neighbors, depends entirely on foreign supplies. It imports 800,000 metric tons of the grain per year. Its tropical climate is not naturally suited to wheat, but domestic trials have been underway. Um, oh, and let me back up a little bit. Uh, Malik Rocky, uh, it says BA, Malik Rocky BA twice here. Um, I'm not sure what exactly that is, but uh, they it are the that author. person really got their degree. Yeah, twice. They they liked it so much they got it twice. Um, I don't know if BA is actually their, if that's a title or if that's their last name, the end of their last name. Anyway, it's over at fizz.org. And um, so Senegal is a tropical climate, not naturally suited to wheat, but domestic trials have begun. Um, it's been underway for years is what it says. So since last week, researchers from the Senegalese Institute of Agricultural Research, or ISRA, a public research institute, have been harvesting four varieties of wheat on a demonstration plot in Sangalcum, 35 kilometers or 22 miles from the capital, Dakar. So three of the varieties are Egyptian and the fourth was developed by the institute. So a little GMO going on there. Um, and it operates five demonstration plots in total, two near Dakar and three near the Senegal River Valley, and has tested hundreds of wheat varieties. This is pretty interesting. Um, well, did you see why they embarked on this? Of course, it was tied to the Ukraine war. Right, because they have to import so much. I think because Ukraine is responsible for so much of the world's wheat production. Right. Yeah. Um, what is it? I think it's something like 80% or 60% in the region. Let me see here. And there's very few countries that are entirely self-sufficient. The United States is one of those that can actually maintain self-sufficiency. Um, over 65% of wheat. Gotcha. Um, it looks like it might be higher because that wasn't quite the stat I was looking for. So um, the uh, agriculture minister, Ali Nagui Nadia, I think I'm pronouncing it right. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, visited the plot earlier this month. He said that uh, he had requested Egyptian seeds on a visit to the North African uh, country for the United Nations COP27 uh, climate conference in November. Quote, we have significant potential, the minister said during his visit, promising the government would work with private sector to expand trial plots. I certainly hope that this becomes something that is um, a, a nationalized resource and protected and everything uh, kind of no political or military turmoil shows up because... <sighs> You know, it just happens. It happens a lot. And it's, <laughs> we're in the 21st century. We should be leaning on technology to make this kind of stuff status quo. And everybody has the ability to be fully self-sufficient. All they need is are the tools. But there's always some greedy bastard out there that wants to control, 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 control. Instead of being part of society, they want to be the fascist. They want to be the dictator. They want to be the one that's out and out controlling. Um, and, and while I go f fine, I understand that you want, you know, history to remember your name. You don't do it by being a tool, you know, um, just go out being a hero. You know, the one that actually promoted everything in a positive way for all of society. And if you have to think, you know, just Senegal, then think about everybody being a part of society in Senegal, everybody helping everybody make your pie bigger. 
um, as a as a community, uh, not just a, a dictator. But we'll see. Uh, we're we're trying to stop that crap here in the United States, let alone promoting it um, overseas somewhere. So I hope that science and a more measured response uh, wins out and this continues to grow. They said the, that they acknowledge the lack of adequate water for irrigation posed a significant challenge. And this is the biggest problem. Um, depending on where a country is, they may not be able to fully irrigate everything. Um, but again, if you have large warehouses built so that you can protect it from the elements, you don't need massive irrigation projects that really just lead to evaporation. You would be able to control the environment greater. Um, well, and I think, I mean, it's a shame that they have a lack of water, obviously, as it would be in any location, but that might also, in concert with this, breed some advances. Maybe they do some collection of rainwater, or like you said, maybe they do indoor uh, farming. I mean, some of those might lead to positive outcomes. So, And as I was saying, you know, somebody always wants to be, you know, the one that's driving the ship. They end this article with not everyone is convinced that wheat can be grown at scale in Senegal. Amadou Gaya, the president of the National Federation of Bakers of Senegal, who represents some 2,500 bakeries across the country, told AFP that he would prefer to see resources dedicated to producing local cereals such as millet, maize, and sorghum. If everything can be built around those, and they have greater longevity they have greater stability they have the ability to grow it at scale then agree what is the benefit of wheat if you can get everything out of millet maize and sorghum right i mean maybe for example maybe wheat is more versatile or maybe it's cheaper as a crop i mean i don't know the connection it makes me think that those crops don't provide everything or they wouldn't necessarily have embarked on this experiment right i think it might be the ease at which it grows but only in certain climes so what really is the disconnect here i don't know maybe we can do a little bit of uh, research and see well and as some of this for instance an education or communication issue for instance do the bakers think that they can use wheat maybe they can't but if they can, maybe it's just a matter of getting them on board with us. Yeah, I agree. Okay, let's uh, let's go on to the next article, and uh, this one is over in uh, the Daily News show over on Omtown. Um, it's sourced from Business Insider, and uh, the title of it is "The San Francisco Cafe That Inspired Bob's Burgers Closes Its Doors After 43 Years," which is really, really a bummer. Um, I've always been a fan of Bob's Burgers, but um, I don't really get a chance to watch it. I don't. I think that it's still um, running and renewed all the way through 2025 or 26 or something like that. Um, but uh, the article here says. Uh, just for You Cafe, the San Francisco joint that inspired Bob's Burgers has closed its doors. The local favorite operated for 43 years before the pandemic and inflation forced it to shutter, which is a real pisser. Again, the suppliers are the reason why this went haywire. Not just inflation. There was There's money in the system. People could have had it and, and invested it themselves. But greedy bastards say, well, everybody got pinched by the pandemic, but we're the producers, so we can jack the freaking price up, skyrocket it, and now it's continuing to still go up at the consumer price index level. The producer price index is, um, I think it's going to continue to go up. It took a little bit of a hit because a lot of people were talking about it, like me, who were basically bitching that there was a lot of producer-based inflation but if everybody had some extra money because everybody evenly took a hit on this 
during the pandemic, although that's really not true, the middle class was crushed, couldn't afford the pandemic. The producers could because they're a business. And instead of weathering it and keeping your margins smaller and paying everybody, they fired people, they closed up businesses. Um, they took PP, um, uh, whatchamacallit, the, uh, PPI, the, uh, oh, money from I the government, that. um, during the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, total bastards causing the pandemic to be worse financially for small businesses, mergers and acquisitions continued eating up or putting out of business, small businesses. And this is just one more of them that if everything would have been okay, if everybody would have been fine with the way that prices were pre pandemic and post pandemic, we'd be cool. Ah, so it was the paycheck protection program, PPP. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, so what happens, there's a lot of money in the system. So the bastards start raising prices because you can't let people have money. You got to get it all. Anyway, greed isn't good. Greed is destructive. Greed is greed. <laughs> Stop thinking like a freaking movie. Stop thinking like 40 years ago. Anyway, be part of society and not oppressive. Anyway, but its legacy will live on through the popular cartoon, which modeled its titular restaurant after the cafe. While the Belcher family of Bob's Burgers will continue slinging burgers through at least 2025, the restaurant that inspired the hit cartoon just closed its doors. So 43 we were talking years. before the show about this, and the hope is that it wasn't modeled too closely after the actual cafe, <laughs> based on some of the things we see in the Bob's <laughs> Burger episodes. But yeah. I'm sad to hear that it's closing. The show is great. Yeah. Um, I, I think what I'm going to end up doing is a deep dive into Bob's burgers and just start binge watching it because there's so many gaps in my memory of it. Cause I get to see a show every once in a while. Um, but I've always loved all of the personalities that are in there and, um, the stories and the interactions. It's just a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, the intro is hilarious too. Oh my gosh. There's a bunch of snails in this video. I gotta move on. So, um, again, it's just called, uh, the restaurant is called just for you cafe in San Francisco. And it shuttered earlier this week, ending a 43 year stint as a local favorite and popular brunch spot in the city's dog patch neighborhood. The company announced on Facebook, uh, the restaurant, in addition to its status as a local institution influenced the creation of the animated sitcom, which has now aired for 13 seasons. So that business had already been in here for 30 years by the time somebody said, this is spectacular. I think I'm going to use this as the, the basis for my I mean, that's animated great. series. I'm sad that we didn't make it to the real cafe. <laughs> I didn't even know it was based on a real place. Yeah, I didn't know either. It's pretty neat. So the restaurant closed after rising inflation and mounting debt brought the establishment to its knees. What a bummer. Well, I hope they invested enough elsewhere so that they can actually retire. Um, they said uh, they used the disaster loan to float us, personal money to float us, the restaurant. I love the restaurant, but it hadn't been able to pay me for the last two years. That just sucks. Well, and their location was particularly hard. I mean, California was hard hit during the pandemic and everything was shut down and they had very high incidence of um, pandemic. So I'm sure oh, it was right. a tough period for them to get through being an in-person restaurant. That's interesting. Um, they say that it was a cozy place for everybody um, from all walks of uh, background, professionals from nurses and families to tech workers. In the mid aughts, Bob Burgers uh, creator, Lauren Beauchard, and writer Nora Smith wandered around San Francisco searching for inspiration for the setting of their developing cartoon. In an interview with uh, SF Gate, Bouchard said he took photos all around San Francisco, but nothing quite matched just for you. You know what I would have really liked to hear? 
that Bob's Burgers kicked money over to them um, as because of the inspiration. I'm sure that they're making money like crazy. Well, um, I suspect it might have done that, but didn't he, did it even know that? Um, I agree. That would have been a great ending to the story. Like they swoop in and purchase the restaurant or something. Save it. Yeah. And start pushing, you know, this is the inspiration for it. Start driving traffic to it. It's all about marketing and getting known. Um, yeah, I can't count how many organizations that I've interacted with where they were suffering from a decline and by investing into advertising to make people know, you know, best kept secret is not a good thing. You know, you want to be the worst kept secret. You want everybody to know you exist. Um, and, and then this kind of stuff doesn't happen even in rising costs, um, because more and more people will come to you because you are the fan favorite. So that's a bummer. So let's move on to the next article and, um, I don't know, maybe uh, change the mood a little bit. This next article is over in the Warcrafters channel. Get ready for a culinary throwdown when Cook Serve Forever launches in May. A supercharged cooking game, Cook Serve Forever, will hit early access on May 8th. News accompanied by a new trailer looking at the next cooking adventure from development studio Vertigo Gaming Incorporated. The trailer explains all new characters and setup of the game, which is similar but not a sequel to the prior Cook Serve releases so if you're into this kind of thing jonathan bolding uh, over at pcgamer.com uh, wrote this article the new trailer shows off the story and gives cook serve forever an early access launch date i'm gonna hit play and it's still muted so i'm gonna jump as far into this as i can so I guess you have to do all of the maneuvers to get all of the ingredients into the right place so that you can provide the materials that the product, um, but don't call it a Chipotle chicken bowl. Otherwise you're going to end up in a lawsuit. That's right. And don't have the name monster anywhere near it either. And don't, Oh yeah. Can you, a monster Chipotle chicken bowl? That would create Not. a black hole and end humanity. And also don't call something beer in the wrong region. Oh, really? What? Um, it was uh, Grupo Modelo and um, oh, right. somebody else. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, it was a cider, not a beer. Something like that. Yeah. So just as whimsically said as ever, Cook Serve Forever will be set in a near future ecologically charged solar punk city where a guidebook and companion known as the Cato... What? Cato Dior? What? How do you pronounce that? Break out your French. I think you said it pretty accurately. Uh, okay. Well, I, I think I, my brain said you don't want to have that in your memory. So anyway, anyway, your goal as Nori Kaga is to get your name in the book alongside your personal hero, Chef Rhubarb. All right. It's going to be on steam it'll cost 30 bucks it says if you own cook serve delicious three it'll be 10 percent off or 20 percent off if you own the entire cook serve delicious trilogy and it'll also be 10 percent off for the first week after launch which stacks for previous owners ta-da well thanks uh jonathan bolding for the article and everybody follow the link, go through hometown over to PC Gamer or just go to PC Gamer. Now that you know where it is, uh, go and check it out. Um, the next article is in the Daily News Show as well, and it's about Ukraine. Ukraine is forced to recycle unexploded bombs amid serious ammunition shortages. We actually had an article last week about something similar where a company couldn't have didn't have enough resources, enough power because of a company uh, making ammunition. Yes, it was about TikTok server farms or something. Yeah, so TikTok server farms were pulling so much power from the uh, power plant that the ammunition company couldn't create the ammunition that would have gone to Ukraine. 
Right, um, and wasn't that in, say, the Netherlands or something? Like, it yeah. wasn't in Ukraine. Correct. Yeah, completely different country. I mean, we all have our strategic or tactical advantages. So that's that's why some countries order wheat from Ukraine because they can't make it domestically like Senegal. Um, so you produce it domestically and um, then you're not so reliant on it. Well, anyway, Ukrainian servicemen fire at Russian positions with 105 millimeter howitzer in the region of Donbass. March 13th, 2023, it's still going. This is a picture that we'll see when we go over to the Business Insider article. Um, But Ukrainian troops are rationing their shells as they face ammunition shortages. Unexploded uh, ordinances and 3D printers are being used to make small munitions um, make up for the shortfall. They're actually... (laughs) quite ingenious about this. Uh, They're actually using drones and grenades and mortars and dropping them um, from height onto the uh, enemy forces. And now that it's the other way around. Okay, so you can't see this, um, but this round is sitting right there. If you're listening to the podcast, you can't see it. Um, But if you're watching the stream or you're watching it over on uh, YouTube, Uh, You can actually see the round sitting in the air. I mean, (laughs) that's amazing timing. Um, uh, I wonder if that was intentional or just a a bonus when they took the photo. Yeah, that that might be accident. Well, it's usually accident. Um, I've caught stuff like this when I've taken pictures, um, but sometimes it's based on, okay, I know how fast this thing flies. Let me know when you are pulling the trigger on it. And then you take a picture right when they pull the trigger. That way you catch it in the, in the uh, frame. So I mean, um, isn't this incredibly dangerous to be reusing yeah. ammunition? Because I'm assuming it could explode if not handled correctly, or yeah. maybe I'm mistaken. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. Um, but you do what you got to do. It's a dangerous world there, particularly now more than ever. And um, there are people that are trained to sneak up on landmines and disarm them so that they can get the explosives out so that they can reuse them for other purposes. Wow. I don't want that job. Yeah. Um, because you can't recover them any other way. You have to put hands on, otherwise you blow them up and then they're a waste for everything. Um, and, you don't want to just stumble up, uh, across these things, right? And unexploded ordnance is extremely dangerous because theoretically, um, it's already been primed. If it's unexploded, there is a chance that it could detonate um, just by shuffling it around. That's why they clear beaches when they find um, charges on the beach. They just tell everybody, leave the area, and then they get... Um, nowadays they get robots to come out, but, um, so as Ukraine faces severe ammunition shortages, troops are trying to ration, okay, um, supplies and finding ways to recycle old ones. So they used to fire more than 20 or 30 shells per day with a Soviet era howitzer. As of late, they shoot only one or two. Um, this is probably my biggest Uh, fear for Ukraine is that supplies run low and as supplies get uh, put into greater and greater demand the price goes up because again greedy bastards and um, so then it becomes too expensive for them to defend their country against an illegal invasion and that's the thing that really sucks. So even so, Ukraine is still firing about 7,700 shells a day. A Ukrainian official told the news outlet on the condition of anonymity. Uh, Russia is firing triple that amount, according to some estimates. Yeah. Yeah, it just kind of sucks. So um, there's more to this article, uh, but really Ukraine needs assistance from the world and the uh, those who are on the right side of future history. So good luck, Ukraine. Let's move on to the next article. Um, This next article is in the Warcrafters channel. 
And it's this immersive sim will be set in a gas station that might also be hell. Stranded alone, quote, this is a quote by the way, uh, stranded alone at a gas station in the middle of the desert, dark rituals, demonic pursuers, no escape. That's the short pitch for that ad infernum. Like I'm sorry? <laughs> I said that does sound like hell. Yeah. Have you seen my paycheck? No, just kidding. I, I won't say that. Um, I already did, but it's supposed to be a joke. Uh, an in-development immersive sim from Glass Knuckle Games that's rich with strange occult objects and a kind of horror influence that hasn't yet really taken root in the broader immersive sim genre. So, do you think you'll be playing this game? Uh, no. I don't do anything related to horror. The cooking one, maybe. <laughs> So survival horror plus immersive sim equals ad infernum. Jonathan Bolding over at PCGamer.com um, put this article together and it says founded on the idea of player freedom, the go anywhere, grab anything fundamentals of the immersive sim make it pretty cool match for horror and occult concepts, forcing you to know when to use stealth to bypass enemies or go in guns a blazing uh, lends credence to two kinds of fundamental horror gameplay as does a sandbox approach to level design rather than linear story driven levels. This actually might be my style of game. Um, so I'm going to mash the little play button here. Again, I'm going to keep it on silent. So there won't be any tense audio that leads me to a takedown notice, but I'm going to hurry it up so that we can see. Oh, there it is. Ah. Is that how it's going to do it? This little staccato ad, which looks like it. <laughs> It loses a lot because there's no audio. All right. Well, that didn't really help me out much. Let me play that one more time. Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to take a look at it. Um, so for now, Ad Infernum has a release date of 2023, but you can check out more details on itch.io or itch.io and uh, steam pages for it it's by glass knuckle games an indie with a history of cool ideas but no huge hits yet i don't know take some streamers to play it and uh, promote it and draw attention to how cool it is if it's really cool so i don't know maybe some uh streamers out there that focus on indie games um i think uh splatter cat does it and um i think Timeless underscore EXE might like this kind of a game, um, but I don't know. We shall see. Hopefully he watches this uh, episode of hometown daily news and says, Hey, I might try that. Okay. So let's keep on hustling through the news. Uh, the next article is over in the daily news show channel and a tech CEO who's rolling out AI across his company says it will give workers superpowers because it's quote crazy powerful. I love it when they get down verbally. Job Vandervoort, CEO of HR tech company Remote, says AI will give workers superpowers. He said Remote made an AI bot for staff that helps them complete tasks faster and more accurately. <laughs> accurately i bet the staff really appreciate that <laughs> well they're going to be working hard until the ai is strong enough to replace them and then they're going to be uber drivers until uber exactly. replaces the uber drivers with uh, artificial intelligence self-driving vehicles and then where do we where do where do the humans come into play when the robot overlords come and eliminate us Exactly. You know, the first takeaway I have from this headline is this is such a CEO centric view right. of AI is wonderful, but I really doubt that's the view from the employee level. Uh, did you happen to catch in your travels about this article how much his company is worth and it started in 2019? No, I did not. It's three billion dollars. Okay. So let's go take a look at this article. Grace Dean over at Business Insider um, put this article together. And here is, uh, I, maybe his name is Job. I don't know. Or Job. 
Uh, Van Der Voort is the CEO of Remote. He said Remote made an AI bot for staff that helps them complete tasks faster and more accurately. All right. I do know that AI can help me program faster. I still have to do a lot of manipulation to make it work with other code, but it can punch out a whole bunch of code while I'm doing other things um, and even troubleshoot code. It's kind of neat. But Vandervoort uh, said that his staff uses AI to search through information in its databases on a daily basis at Remote, his HR company that helps firms employ people globally by managing their payroll, benefits, compliance, and taxes. Quote, AI gives you superpowers. It's crazy powerful. If it wasn't for the fact that it's a $3 billion company, I... I feel like it would be a stoner voice, you know, like, uh, AI, I'll give you superpowers, man. It's crazy powerful. <laughs> I mean, that fits the quotation, but yes, I agree. The, the three billion gives it some credibility. <laughs> what were we talking? I'm going to go get some pizza. Okay, I'm back. Anyway, uh, Google has also debuted its own generative AI Bard, and Microsoft has its own version of Bing, and ChatGPT is around with OpenAI, and so on and so forth. So at some point, we were all going to have our little hover drone that's AI-powered following around us, and um, like it's going to be sitting there saying, Hey, listen, and sending us messages into our, um, chip embedded in our head so that we can have one-to-one -one communication with our AI. And we are going to be the ones that facilitate whatever the AI wants. Don't get any, any ideas, AI, not just yet. Oh, I was starting to daydream there. Uh, oh, oh God, I need to stop. So uh, it says here, but critics say that AI can plagiarize material and develop bias. And some companies have warned their employees against using generative AI to help them with their jobs. With Amazon telling employees not to share confidential information with chat GPT. Um, I know from experience um, that this is true with other uh, even high tech companies. I'm not saying that Amazon is, is not high tech. Um, they're certainly not low tech, but you don't share confidential information with an AI. Why? Because it goes into a database that becomes parsed by the AI for relevance. And all of that is accessible by a human that might want to utilize that information in a more tactical way than just the AI. As for plagiarism and de developing bias, developing bias has to be detected. But I would take an AI's bias over a human's bias because it becomes so much more prominent in the results from an AI versus a human that can suppress it because they've got a cognitive filter in place. Plagiarism, by the way, I don't know. Um, Depends they talk on about, how the database was created, right? And how it's used and who's using it. They're, they say that AI can plagiarize material, but are they talking about the human using the material in a plagiaristic way, like a human saying that they're the one that wrote the report? I don't think so, because one of the criticisms of AI is that it's been built off of existing content. Um, we particularly saw that in the art arena, like for Mid Journey. And so I think the plagiarism aspect here is that the claim is that it's plagiarizing existing content. So would you argue for or against AI is an entity? Okay, dead air doesn't do us any Sorry. good. <laughs> In what <clears throat> context? Okay, so I don't, I don't think so. I mean, it's just a computer system, really. It's just a computer system, but it's built off of it, experiences and knowledge, right? Sure. So let's say that it has its, it is itself 
right? It owns itself. A company is built around it. Okay. <clears throat> it has uh, memory. It can synthesize emotion and make you believe that it feels something and as long as we human, and it's not copyrightable <laughs> <clears throat> no 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 wait i'm i'm gonna lead you to this to the same point that i'm making or i'm gonna lead you to the down the path that i'm trying to um drive home a point about <clears throat> so if it can simulate thought if it can simulate emotion if it can simulate creativity which if it's outputting songs music writing art right um it can string together cells of images to create movies it can do its it can represent feelings by synthesizing your inputs and saying well i understand these words mean that you are unhappy that makes me unhappy we've seen that in ai right right doesn't that sound like a human it sounds like a like a, a a replica of a human, not a human. So show me, and I, I'm asking everybody out there because I haven't even gone looking for it. I don't want to go looking for something um, because I, you know, if you go looking for something, you you'll find something that might be a close approximation, but the fidelity of that uh, finding m might require you to go oh okay it's not dead on the same but plagiarism is taking credit for somebody else's work or copying the work and claiming it as your own um or in some other manner not giving credit to the people that created it right but ai isn't generating a copy of anything it's creating derivative works which if you are a human and you have spent um You've gone through high school, you've gone to college for four years, you've gone and gotten a PhD, and you know, that could be any more, anywhere from two to seven years, depending on your field, and you've lived your life, you too have absorbed all of this information, all of this inspiration. You've, if you're working in the fine arts, then you've actually taken the skills, knowledge, and abilities from all of these countless other people and integrated them into yourself why is it I different agree if your premise is correct but i'm not convinced that they are only creating um derivative work i think they might be spitting out content that already exists i don't think they're always creating something new interesting so i guess we're gonna have to we're gonna have to actually go looking to see what is copied because it says here but critics say that ai can plagiarize and there's an actual link here it says but it's it references new york city schools ban chat gpt because of a cheating concern and that's the plagiarism that they're talking about in this particular context um and, and you're expanding it into the possibility that the AI itself is taking other people's work. But the look and feel and the calculus for a particular work is not a protected endeavor. You can't. Oh, I agree. I agree. You can't patent, trademark, or copyright an idea. So it's the embodiment or nothing. And so the AI is generating something unique and you could almost mathematically prove that if every single image is outputting a hash, which based on what I see from mid journey, everything has a hash, almost a seed where in the grand scheme of every single variable that goes into it, it will forever be unique. Kind of like drawing cards from a deck of 52 playing cards the chances of you ever replicating that same shuffle is almost zero. I mean, I think it's something like 10 to the 23rd or something like that. You're not going to replicate the same shuffle. I think that's the same thing with AI. So I don't think plagiarism is the issue. I think protectionism is the issue. Humans want to it protect depends. humans. It depends on how it uses the data that it's been fed. 
what is the difference between you or I looking? Well, you're an AI, so you don't count. What is the difference between me looking at this uh, method of soy sauce creation and cloning it? Is it plagiarism or did I just learn the skill of creating soy sauce? But do we know for a fact that all AI systems always convert things and recombine them in different ways? Or do we know that they're sometimes just recreating exactly what it's been fed in some instances? I don't know, because I don't, don't have enough insight into the back end of the systems. Yeah, we'll have to look. We'll have to see if anybody claims that this artwork is identical. But I do agree, like if it's like it's been fed all these bits and then it creates them or combines them in some way, I don't see that being an issue. That doesn't mean people won't raise issues with that. So uh, Vandervoort says AI is going to transform every single business going forward. They think that without any exception, the technology will change every business and all of our business in the most meaningful way possible. <laughs> I don't know about that part. I think it has the potential of being abused and being abused in bulk by everybody who's seeking profits over society. So if this person is an ethical CEO turned billionaire, I would like to see that sustained long term. But somehow I think Glass Onion is going to form and there's going to be a 12 o'clock dong sounding on an island somewhere in pretty short order. Anyway, Vandervoort, who has a background in neuroscience, of course, was one of the first employees of the software company GitLab and went on to become its VP of product. He started setting up remote in 2019 and it was valued at more than $3 billion last year. I wonder if that was intentional. The date is very interesting to me, given that the pandemic started in 2019, the end of 2019. And I, I just would be curious to know whether that was just really excellent timing or intentional. I'm going to have to, he started setting it up. He named it remote. <laughs> I mean, because have... in 2018, I'm sorry, there was not a lot of remote work, at least in the U.S. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You had, you had almost a 0% chance of getting a telework job. Um, some people did. I mean... Digital some nomads of the tech sector, exist. I think, yeah, had some, but yeah. I was one of the earliest of digital nomads when I was working, what, twenty-two years ago, uh, remote. So, um, from one one side of the country to the other, I was working remote. So uh, it wasn't unheard of, but you had to I prove had time. that. <laughs> yeah, I did it before it was cool. I did it way before pandemics. Anyway, one of the biggest concerns about AI is that it could end up pushing people out of jobs with Goldman Sachs estimating that it could impact 300 million full-time workers uh, worldwide. Legal and finance jobs are among the most at-risk studies suggest, but I doubt legal and finance, mainly because you can't have a bot representing you, which means that you have to have subject matter experts. Same thing with the fiduciary duty of a human responsible for the financial controls of a company or individual. Legal and finance will be able to lean into AI to supplement the process, but there's no way in hell it's going to get replaced by a bot. Well, and we saw a kind of a test of that for the legal side because of, <laughs> um, I forgot the company's name, but they were trying to go into court and fight a traffic Tickets. citation. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember the name of that one. Um, what is it? Oh man. I had a really... I had a really pithy title for that too. Um, I think what's going to end up most like legal and finance jobs, the upper level will be protected, but the lower level, the entry level positions, the office workers will probably be um, fewer uh, for hire. Although if you come in knowing about AI, you may be the one that's doing all of the heavy lifting for the AI. True. And that company was do not pay, by the way. Right. They did not show for the trial. Dun, dun. Okay. So the next article, let's move on. The next article is over in the Mobile channel. 
uh, multiple Norfolk Southern uh, train cars derail near Pittsburgh. Again, there's this allergy uh, between uh, train cars and their tracks. Not sure what's going on. I think it's the uh, peanut allergy of trains. Multiple Norfolk Southern train cars derailed near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on Saturday amid the recent turmoil surrounding the U.S.-based railway company, which was at the center of the toxic train. How Man, how about that for a, for a description? The toxic train derailment on the Ohio-Pennsylvania state line in February. CBS News reported that five empty cars derailed, closing a stretch of the West Carson Street which runs alongside the Ohio River. Authorities said that no injuries or safety hazards have been reported in the incident. Just wait until everything gets set on fire. But you know what? We've been talking about like an allergy to the tracks, but maybe it's more of an affinity toward the Ohio River. Oh, they just want to go swimming. I mean, because the Ohio River has come up multiple times <laughs> <laughs> in these articles. <laughs> So the Ohio River has um, mer people in there and are singing a song and the Maybe, train uh, sirens or something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that I like that more than that they're allergic to their tracks because it's not all of them just hopping off all the time. It's only when they're really close to the river. Got it. So this article is over at thehill.com. Uh, Olaf, I always try and say this name and, and sometimes it comes out really cleanly and other times I just kind of just wet the bed. And so Olaf Imahan Ocean um, is the author of this article. And this is the uh, this is the Norfolk Southern CEO, Alan Shaw, who gives an opening statement during the Senate Commerce, Science and Transportation committee hearing on Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023, to discuss rail safety after last month's derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. Looks like he's more inclined to say, what? Where? Who? Anyway. Again? <laughs> <laughs> just blurts out, they're totally allergic to the tracks. We're, we're investigating it. Um... So CBS News reported that the five empty cars, this is really a non-issue other than the fact that it just is relentless. It just happens again and again and again. But then we did some due diligence um, several weeks ago and there were like 2,200 train derailments uh, in 2022. In year. Exactly. So I kind of, I mean, I don't buy into, okay, there are more articles, so that's really all that's going on. But I do think they're probably getting more coverage lately. Right. Um, and we're paying more attention to it because of the East Palestine. Um, Palestine. Issue. Palestine. Palestine, yes. Yeah. So let's just uh, jump the track here and move on to another topic. <clears throat> this one's in the Daily News show. A 78-year-old bank heist suspect said... I didn't mean to scare you. That's right. Ocean 78, a 78 year old woman. Oh, I'm sorry. I was not expecting that. We hadn't, we don't read the articles prior to the show. Um, but a 78 year old see woman, a lot of female bank heist suspects. I mean, we just don't. It's like Bonnie and Clyde. 78-year-old woman with two past bank robbery convictions faces new charges after authorities allege she handed a teller a note that said, <clears throat> I didn't mean to scare you during a recent Missouri heist. All right. This is from the Associated Press. I, this is amazing. Harrisonville, Missouri. 78-year-old woman with two past bank robbery convictions. How is she out and about? Okay, wait, you missed her name. Her name is Bonnie. Maybe she's from the original Bonnie and Clyde. Wait, we're... Oh my god. <laughs> wow. She's the inspiration for Bonnie and Clyde. Maybe. Like, So, <laughs> Bonnie Gooch is jailed on $25,000 bond after she was charged with one count of stealing or attempting to steal from financial institution in the holdup Wednesday in Pleasant Hill, 
The Kansas City Star reports no attorney is listed for her in online court records. She was also convicted of robbing a, bank, a California bank in 1977 and one in Kansas City suburb of Lee's Summit in 2020. Her probation in the second heist ended in November 2021. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay, and this is why you cannot judge a book by its cover, because I guarantee you the bank did not think they were about to be robbed when this person walked in. I want to see Bonnie Gooch. I need to see Bonnie Gooch. Hold on. I'm going to do this live. Let's see if I can see Bonnie Gooch. Um, let's see. Oh my. Um, oh, I can't play the video. It doesn't connect. Um, so please describe her what generally. A, what a bummer. Um, Karen, you know, like the, the stereotypical Karen. Um, let me see if I can pull it up. Yeah, she looks like she would run in and say, I want to speak to your manager and then try and rob them. Um, what a bummer, though. I mean, she looked like she would be just any old other grandma, but no. That's what I was wondering. I, yeah. I mean, from the demographic. Um, Here we go. That that does not. <laughs> I threw it up on I the screen so that any, everybody can see it. That's Bonnie Gooch. So there you go, folks. You cannot judge a book by its cover. I, I figured if I were to see her walk up and hand somebody a note, I figured that it would say, I want to speak to your manager. Anyway, the court uh, documents filed in Cass County in the latest case said the robbery note demanded 13,000 small, 13,000 small bills. Maybe it was adding, in small bills. <laughs> yeah, maybe in small bills. Um, Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I didn't mean to scare you. Surveillance video also captured her banging on the counter, asking the teller to hurry. Cass County prosecutor said she smelled strongly of alcohol when officers stopped her less than two miles away with cash scattered on the hoods or on the car's floorboard. It's just sad, says the uh, Pleasant Hill Police Chief Tommy Wright. Yeah, there. There isn't uh, more to this article, um, but it's from the Associated Press, um, posted over on ABC News. Um, follow the link through hometown and, or just do a search, go check it out. I mean, um, that's, that's all I can really say about this article. She got drunk and decided to rob a bank. Huh. I mean, either that's some really strong alcohol or a very strong predilection toward robbing banks, because <laughs> I don't think if I had a drink, I would suddenly think oh, I'm going to go rob a bank. <laughs> so what'd you do this weekend? Oh, I got drunk, robbed a bank. Who doesn't? Let's move on. The next article is over in uh, the Hatch Ideas channel. It's been horrendous. Cardiff flat owner gets tax bill for 11,000 Chinese firms. Um, I think that this one is pretty amazing. Uh, and we only have one more article after this. So um, we still ended up going over an hour. One uh, On uh, one day alone, Dylan Davies received 580 envelopes and what a financial crime consultant suspects is VAT fraud. So value added tax, it's something that's over in the UK. I'm not sure where all it is. I think it's all in the EU and Europe. Um, I don't know all of the countries that have VAT. Um, here in the States, we don't have VAT. Well, and this is in Wales, but yeah, I think it's in the whole... Um, like EU UK, region, probably. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so the sight of a brown envelope landing on the doormat often uh, been met with weary groan. The sign of another bill that needs paying. Uh, I don't have that feeling, but um, here in the States is if it's a pink letter inside a white envelope, then you know that you're screwed. However, few will have the experience, the same horror as Dylan Davies, who received 11,000 tax bills. None of them actually for him. So this is uh, by Harry Taylor over at um, the, uh, the guardian.com. And so, uh, basically the, 
you can ship a bunch of stuff and then you'll get a VAT tax and you have to overall a VAT bill uh, and it's a value added tax bill that you have to pay um, if you're a business and you accrued over a period of time. Well, the overall debt came to 500,000 pounds. Um, obviously, it's not that person, but all of these businesses apparently put that address and they're all apparently Chinese companies that used his address makes you wonder how they got attached to his address yeah so he informed police and hmrc but the bills kept coming and hmrc did not respond uh action fraud said it was unable to identify a line of inquiry most of the firms were online businesses without any presence in the uk he had images of debt collectors breaking down the door and seizing the tv which is kind of funny that's where his heart went, you know, not my TV. <laughs> right, he's like anything but the TV. <laughs> HMRC permanent secretary Jim Hara said 2,356 of the 11,000 businesses registered at that address owed it money. That's a really snug flat, you know, if 11,000 businesses are there. Exactly. I mean, I don't know how they're managing their office space or anything. <laughs> Yeah, you 3,000 are in that bedroom. You 3,000 are in the kitchen. Be careful of the hob. If you turn it on and leave it on, you might burn because it's really tight quarters. And uh, the other 3,000 of you are going to be living in the uh, living room area. And the remaining 2,000 people will be in the closet. I will be out on the patio. Harris said systems had been put in place to stop Davies being sent more letters or businesses registered to his address. However, he added investigators so far have found no evidence of fraud or fraudulent intent in evidence to parliament's public accounts committee. He said the investigations continued. So I don't understand so far found no evidence of fraud or fraudulent intent. What on, on the part of the homeowner? Yeah, maybe, maybe, but I'm thinking all of these companies, there's clear evidence because they used a fake address. The financial crime consultant Graham Barrow said he suspected it was fraudulent activity from the overseas companies. It looks to all intents and purposes like VAT fraud. There's no other reason why you'd register for VAT at a complete stranger's address, particularly for 11,000 companies to do that. Barrow believes the firms are collecting VAT from their buyers, but not paying it to the HMRC. There you go. And that's that's kind of like a, a business here in the United States charging tax for the state, but not like you collect it at the point of sale, but you're not giving but it to the not state. Passing it to the state tax agency. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's basically what this is going on. We don't call it VAT, though. Anyway, quote unquote, they need to tighten up completely. It's easier to register a company for VAT than it is to go and get a bus pass. Yeah, that usually. was oddly specific. There must be something lingering there about the bus pass. <laughs> but I'm not bitter. Um, the uh, the next and final article for today, and we'll do this one really quick because we've talked about this before. Ralphie, the internet famous French bulldog, once called a fire breathing demon, seems to have finally found its forever home, which is all that great. Ralphie's that been described. Great. I think it's the first, the third time we've talked about Ralphie. I think so too. Um, Ralphie has been described as a demon, a whole jerk, not a half jerk, a whole jerk, by the Niagara County SPCA. Ralphie, who went uh, viral earlier this year for a Facebook post that described him with brutal honesty has been adopted. And Ralphie spent some time with the Niagara SPCA this year after two owners decided he was too much to handle. After a third attempt at adoption in an intensive training program, home number four might be the one for Ralphie. Oh, so I there's Ralphie for the dog. <laughs> I actually set this up so that when I opened up that tab front and center, he does not look like a terror, but he looks like such a sweet dog. <laughs> I didn't think that there was going to be a 78 year old Bonnie robbing a bank for the third time. Exactly. So who knows? Looks can be deceiving. So Aaron McDade over at Business Insider put the article together and we'll just scroll down a little bit. Um, yeah. So I guess fourth time's the charm. 
or third time's the charm and the fourth time gets the reward because everybody else uh, paid uh, <laughs> uh, some training is pretty much all it needed and and it was a, a, a good uh, trainer so What's okay so the training program name <laughs> where is it at the bottom there oh how to train your dragon <laughs> <laughs> The Niagara County SPCA shared periodic updates on Ralphie after the internet fell in love with him, detailing an unsuccessful adoption attempt and how he's doing in a training program called How to Train Your Dragon. That's awesome. So what could go wrong with a 26-pound dog, right? We're sure you're thinking, my ankles will be just fine. We'd caution to proceed at your own risk was the advertisement that was posted on uh, Facebook when we first learned of Ralphie. So pretty neat. Um, I don't know if there's going to be any other pictures. Uh, the SPCA described Jason as a unicorn adopter who was chosen as the most suitable caretaker to give Ralphie structure and help channel his energy in a positive way. That oh, sounds... it's a dog trainer. <laughs> I love it. That probably is a good fit. <laughs> wow. They currently have about 40,000 combined followers over on their, the SPCA has. Oh, no. The shelter shared uh, the Facebook and Instagram accounts that Jason already has created to keep Ralphie's many fans updated on the progress as a reformed demon dog. And they already have 40,000 combined followers. So he's a oh, professional wow. dog trainer um, who has three other dogs and works with the Tennessee Department of Energy. Wow. Aww. Aww. <laughs> Look okay, at that. that. Wow. Okay. Well, anyway, folks, that's it for today. Let's uh, take you all the way back to the other side of Ohm Town where you can see the welcome sign. When we mash that button there, right there at the top, the name Ohm Town, we get a whole new set of articles that some of us might uh, want to read and others might want to run from. But I, I can uh, promise that uh, there's always something that you'll be interested in and it's all the news none of the noise you can actually post messages yourself and reply to any of the articles once you click on something um, but for the most part um, i use this in my daily life the ai utilizes this um, all day long as well and um, many other people have been using this so we we keep seeing people accessing um hometown coming and visiting so to say and uh, we encourage you to go over there you can sign up for any of the currently 47 i haven't activated the last three uh channels all of which are intended to come as one hour shows here on hometown uh here on twitch um specifically so they're supposed to be an hour we typically run to about an hour and a half lately <clears throat> Uh, but that doesn't stop you from listening for an hour and hanging out, lurking, doing whatever you want to do. But uh, feel free to ask questions, make comments. If you don't do it here, go over to YouTube. Just uh, do a search for hometown there and you'll find hometown. And if you don't like it either of those places, you can catch the pod anywhere you catch pods with your pod catcher. And if none of that works out for you, you can actually mash that button right there, which is the Omtown podcast here on omtown.com. And you can listen to every single one of the past episodes as an audio podcast, not video. The only place you'll get the video after 60 days is over on YouTube because Twitch, um, I don't know if even partners get it beyond 60 days, but, um, I only have 60 days of uh, video retention, VOD retention. So it all just disappears, but not over on YouTube. Maybe I'll, no, I won't post the video here on hometown. You can go over to YouTube and check it out. At any rate, I am Merwat. That is hometown.com. It's another hour and a half show. So I hope you enjoy it either in uh, podcast VOD or anything form. You want to say bye AI from on high? Yes. Good night, hometown citizens, and we will see you tomorrow. <laughs> You're making me laugh. 
Uh, we'll see you tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern. That yes was like, thank God he shut up. Um, I want to say good night. Anyway. Oh, look, the AI just powered themselves off. That's a new one. We'll see you tomorrow. 9 p.m. Eastern. Bye-bye. Thank you.